Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our March PAM Town Hall Forum. Today's topic is worship in times of COVID from the perspective of a presbytery. Our special guest is Reverend Aisha Brooks Lytle, who serves as executive presbyter for the Presbytery of Greater Atlanta. Today, our discussion is moderated by David Vandermeer, Director of Music and Fine Arts at First Presbyterian Church, Ann Arbor, Michigan. Dave is also the former president of PAM. We want today's town hall to be both active and interactive. Please feel free to type questions or comments in the chat or click on raise your hand at the bottom of the window to speak with the panelists. And now please welcome Aisha Brooks Lytle and David Vandermeer. Thank you, Andrew. Hi, Aisha. Hello, friends. Well, shall we get started? I think so. Great. Hello, everybody. Hello, hello. Well, this pandemic has been with us for about a year now, certainly not an anniversary we want to celebrate, but let's go back to the beginning of this time. Where were you when the things began to pivot due to the pandemic? And where were you, what were you focusing on? And what were your pre-pandemic priorities? Wow, I remember very clearly where I was. Um, I was in St. Simons, uh, Georgia for the small church conference. And um, I was watching a program um, uh, like a YouTube. Uh, there's a, a gentleman named uh, Larry Reed who does uh, kind of gospel, kind of comedy, but also entertainment, but also kind of Pentecostal prophetic stuff. And he had this guest preacher on who was talking about what was to come. And he said, you know, this pandemic is gonna be more than people think. And, and it was an earlier broadcast. And he said, people are gonna, have, are gonna have to move from bricks and mortar to clicks and order. And I thought, wow, that's interesting. I kid you not, within a matter of hours, I looked in the Facebook group chat of our pastors. This is March, you know, 14th, 13th, 14th. And they said, who's closing worship on Sunday? Now, as an executive presbyter, I was like, can you tell the presbytery if you're closing your doors? I was like, oh my gosh. So I get um, the staff on the phone and for two hours, we're trying to make a list of who's gonna close, who's gonna stay open, who's gonna stream. If you look um, in my Facebook, I went live from St. Simon's. I picked up my phone and I said, hey, you know, you can stream, you're gonna be okay. We just have to do this for a few weeks. We'll just have to do it for a few weeks. I, I mean, even saying that um, and encouraging people. And so the, you know, where we were was, hey, we'll talk about vision is 2020. And we had to pivot to see things in a completely different way within a matter of moments. So I remember um, very clearly where, where we were that day and how we had to switch, had to switch over. Thank you. How did the onset of the pandemic impact your life, both professionally and personally? I think the onset was, I guess, no fear, right? Like kind of try to, how do you speak to the anxiety of what is this? I, I think that people moved so quickly, so effectively, so efficiently. Um, professionally like they just they just did the things and they started to um we have like i said we have this facebook group and they said you think we can just have a zoom check-in to just see how we're doing and we've met every wednesday to to like this past week so i think people have had to have pip did the pivot really really well in terms of making sense of we've got to do things different turn on the cameras connect with our people online getting on zoom and all that kind of stuff um Personally, um, I, I go back to that time in St. Simons. I tell this story when we were getting on the plane, there was an issue with the plane and I had to go back um, to Brunswick Airport. And the pilot said, if you hear me say brace, 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 just sit still, put your head between your legs or crouch forward. And he said, brace, brace, brace. And we, you know, we landed the plane and we had to wait and we finally got home. That phrase, I feel like is what happened personally. 
that we just had to keep bracing ourselves for what would be different, how the emergencies, just everything in this year, along with the other pandemics that have come up around race, around um, economic oppression, around the differences in this country. So the personal pivot was brace, brace, brace for me. Thank you. Sure. We have all experienced what the pandemic has done to our own churches, how we plan and participate in worship, how we give pastoral care, even how we carry on the business of the church. Yeah. We have coped in many different ways. Uh, can you give us some examples from your perspective? Sure. Um, a lot of people uh, utilize, just in terms of worship, um, utilize uh, social media, uh, Facebook, live streaming, everyone became an expert with that. Um, YouTube live streaming, folks became an expert with that. Um, Pre-recorded services, people became an expert with that, which you can premiere on Facebook Live or you can premiere on, um, on YouTube. Zoom church, which I think has been really great. Um, I was a guest preacher a couple of times. We'd be on a venue like this and different folks would, would do their part and then the preacher would go up. Again, that can be streamed. So this combination of pre-recorded worship, live streaming, um, there's so many different um, apps that will like that will allow for virtual choirs. I've uh, seen one of the best uh, virtual handbell choirs in one of our churches. If you don't have the handbell phone app, and it, like I've always wanted to play in the handbell, but I've, I've never had a chance. And so I'm mesmerized. You know, I'm trying to keep my composure, but I'm mesmerized because people are either shaking their phone or they're dinging, and it's just sounded absolutely beautiful. I'm like the creativity here is unreal. So watching people um, cultivate that and curate that around worship. I've also seen people um, do a great job with drive-in or drive-through worship. Um, and they've you know, had sort of a, they call it like a tie-through. So people would bring their tithes and offerings during stewardship and you know, distance, but have a prayer um, from their pastor. Uh, folks would come and get the pre-packaged communion and, um, and you know, have parking lot worship. Uh, there are apps that you can stream through FM channels. I'm, I've seen so much creativity. Uh, we just recently had Bruce Reyes Child speak at our presbytery meeting, and he talks about tech deacons. That's probably one of the best things I love about online worship is like, you know, hanging out in the chat. And so, you know, I'm, I'm always an amener, if that makes sense. Like if somebody's preaching, I want them to know that I'm interacting. I'm like, preach sister, amen. So the tech deacons will, you know, so glad to have you. Thank you for worshiping with us. Here's where you can find the scripture. Here's where you can find uh, the liturgy. All of that has been amazing to see um, in these times. So watching people hold space, connect, engage, and make worship and, and even pastoral care accessible. Um, a lot of our pastors have done uh, kind of porch visits um, kind of in the earlier times and they would just bring their chair up to the door or talk to people through the window. Just so much engagement and intentionality and creativity in this time. Yeah, our, our interim pastor has had fireside chats. Yeah, yeah. And that's been a great, um, opportunity for folks as well. And we've had the drive-throughs as well. Yeah. People can bring um, items for mission, local mission. And it's been a great, great thing. So we know technology isn't going away and we know, know um, and that we don't want it to go away because it reaches lots of folks beyond our walls. But many particular older and less affluent members may not have the equipment, much less know how to, or even have the interest uh, in connecting online. So, and these members I think are grieving. Mm. Some are wondering if this experience um, will la uh, last in for the in-church worship. How do we address their needs? I think I'm glad to, to hear that language around grief and loss um, because clearly this is a pivot for everybody, right? in the same way that somebody in person, um, and again, I'm referring back to Bruce's chat with us because it's still um, in my heart, to say aspects of our worship exclude people, whether we mean to exclude them or not. And so the question of how will we now be more intentional 
for any group that may feel excluded. Um, some of our churches that don't have high technology, they do worship over the phone and they call in, which I think is one of the like most creative ways to, to part still participate in that way. I've also seen folks um, walk alongside people that if you just have a phone, they're, they're like little computers in our hands. Sometimes people have the have resources that they don't think that they have, if I can say that in that sense, that they can't imagine what is possible because someone isn't walking alongside of them. Um, I do think that larger issues, and this is where the church can be a voice, asking questions about you know internet uh, capability and access in marginalized and impoverished communities. I remember hearing a story about um, in this pandemic, some kids who were sitting outside of a Taco Bell because that's the only place they could get Wi-Fi to do their homework. Wow. So if the church is noticing that their own parishioners don't have the connect, the ability to connect because of access, then I hope to ask larger questions about access of the internet and, and a hybrid reality is how we're gonna function as a country, then everybody needs to be advocating, not just for worship, but for everybody. What does this mean? And how does it feel when we're when when people are excluded or we're excluded? So I do I think it's a fight worth having or a struggle worth having to stay. Here's the grief and here's the loss. What's the potential? And then what are the ways that we need to advocate for access for all, not only in worship, but for a whole globe that is now hyper connected and having this hybrid reality? Thanks. Our congregation did the pre-recorded worship and then we finally went to a recording in the sanctuary. And during that time, we got such great response just to see this inside of the sanctuary. And, but it seems like worship is tied to the building. What are your thoughts on that? I think it's a both and, right? We're, we're in bodies, right? Like we are, and embodied people. And so there's something about physical space, but I also think there's something about God reorienting us back home. Like, what does that mean that I, you know, this, I love staying black. I love church. Like I'm, I'm a church nerd. If we're in a town, I'm like, let's stop and look in. Like, I love the, the structure and the architecture, but at the same time, how do I, how do I connect with the beauty that's in front of me to point me back to God? right? Like that's what it was for, is to point people back to the source. And so as long as there's not idolatry about the thing that points us back to the source. So having worship outside, you know, on my computer, looking at the trees, is that pointing me back to the source? Being in the sanctuary, looking at the stained glass, is that pointing me back to the source? And I do think that humans, according to the biblical text, we struggle with idolatry a little bit. We like our things, pretty thing, shiny thing, <laughs> right? <laughs> right? So I, I definitely think it's a lesson in having healthy attachments to the things that are supposed to point us back to our God and our maker. So it's a struggle though, because I like it. Is. It really <laughs> is. Yeah. As someone who has spent um, more than 40 years planning music for worship, I especially am worried about congregational singing. Have you heard any ideas about ways to encourage at-home worshipers to participate in the hymns? Yes. Um, I remember um, Cindy, one of our co-moderators, um, doing a hymn sing. Like she would just pick up her hymn book and get on Facebook and sing. And I remember stopping and be like, oh, I'm singing right along with you. Or um, some of my other uh, former co-moderator, Denise, is uh, been doing a hymn plank challenge. And so seeing colleagues like the hymn singing. And so I think any place you can encourage it, I think Zoom is a great way to do it. I also think, you know, if there's like a, you know, a YouTube song or just sharing, like sharing music with people, sharing a playlist um, and encouraging folks, grab somebody at home and sing along, sing to the top of your lungs. Like I, as a vocalist, I cannot imagine anything right stop me from singing, right? I don't care, exactly. pandemic, a man, like nothing's gonna stop me from singing. And so reminding people that this is a, this is a gift and don't, don't be discouraged when you have to utilize the gift in different places. And I know it's been tough, 
But I, you know, I had posted on social media the other day, a couple of weeks ago, I was like, I just miss singing with y'all. That's it. And like 300 people were like, me too. Can you get online and do something? So I think we're doing the best that we can, but anywhere we are, we can lift up our voices and sing. With yeah, singing is such a communal act. It's, it's such a communal act. So I think, I think it's being patient and, and how do we accept two-dimensional space as authentic space? Again, going back to my friend Bruce to say that's also valid space and then singing. Um, my grandmother, God rest her soul, would just sing in a very, very high soprano, very high. Thing. And sometimes I'll just be in the kitchen and I'll tease my mom and I'll sing in a very high falsetto soprano, some old hymn, and she just starts cracking up. But that's our way of saying we're, we're still singing in, in the best way we can. Thanks. Yeah, we're offering a virtual hymn sing to our congregation, both um, with virtual choir plus recorded um, yeah. hymns as well, so people can sing along. I just think people really do miss singing. They do. And we're getting a we're getting a question. If we want to, if you want to interpolate that, Dave, do you see that? Yeah. How do we gently push our pastoral staff to do something different and creative in live streaming our worship services? Our services have looked the same ever since we began not meeting in person? Good question. Yeah. Um, I think examples, I would say as a pastor, sometimes people give you suggestions without some concrete examples. Um, when Bruce did his uh, workshop with us, he gave concrete examples about cameras in the space so that people feel like they are in worship, and I thought that was such a great suggestion. I Meaning you have to kind of move things around. Um, I think there there is also a, a way to interpolate cutaways, if that makes sense, that you're streaming, but then you can cut away to something pre-recorded. I was watching a um, worship service out of Philadelphia and they brought in um, old footage, right? Like old footage of, uh, they had praise dancers in this context old footage of stuff or old footage of the choir so that people can see themselves. Um, I've seen other places where the children will do the call to worship or, or people will do different parts of the prayer. So I think if there are concrete examples that you can offer and suggest and ask how to support the pastoral team to say, what would it take for us to do this new thing or this different thing? Because I'm also watching pre-recording and streaming fatigue um, with our with our leaders and they're they're doing their best but sometimes they need support from those around them to say you know what I saw this thing over here um how about we try that and what would it take to do that and how do we support our pastor and our worship and music committee to kind of pull that off uh, many preachers have expressed frustration about trying to preach authentically to an empty room I assume you have done some of that yourself have you learned something from those experiences? It's hard. <laughs> Very. And it's scary and I am anxious. And every time I record, I'm like, this is the worst sermon on the planet. <laughs> and then I play it back and I'm like, I think the Holy Spirit showed up in that moment. So part of it is, just trusting that God is, is at work with this. Um, so I think, I think that's the, the, be, I don't know, be patient, be okay, be comfortable with being uncomfortable, if that makes sense, and trust that the Holy Spirit really is coming across in two-dimensional space in ways that we will never fully understand. We just won't. And so I, I, I go in with fear and trembling and um, I did have a pastor uh, who was almost at the end of one of her sermons and an insect got in the way and had to re-record. You just have to be, they're the blooper reels. It's just real life, but we're, we're doing it, you know? And so it's, there is no easy answer to that one. I, every time someone asks me, I'm terrified and I look at the camera and I preach and I'm like, I know I'm gonna mess up, Jesus help me. And he helps me every time. So that's my, I try to encourage our pastors um, to just hang in there because it is, it's difficult, absolutely difficult. This kind of goes along too with, um, the, with the pastors. Um, 
Do you have any ideas for new pastors or interim pastors of how to connect to a congregation through a camera? Yeah. Um, I definitely think um, Zoom interactions with people, um, I think smaller groups are great. Breakout sessions, one of our newer pastors um, had, had a drive-by meet and greet and people brought posters and balloons and didn't touch, but just waved at the first family kind of, you know, it was, it was really sweet. So, you know, this space is just as, like even what we're doing right now, we're connecting, we're engaging. This is just as important as if you had to meet face-to-face um, -face with people. Uh, sometimes also just the phone. Like we've, we've Zoomed so much <laughs> that we forget that you know you could just call somebody. <laughs> exactly. And they will pick up and talk to you. Um, and, you know, socially distanced visits. I got to visit with um, one, of, one, of the, um, one of the women um, in our presbytery and had some books to pass along from her husband's library. And we sat socially distanced and we just looked at each other and I brought her some flowers. And I was like, I miss this. <laughs> so finding again, the small ways to do that engagement, which is, which is a lot uh, virtually, but it's the intentionality of it as well. Yeah, we've um, actually had a, a Zoom happy hour and we usually have a topic related to the sermon or the theme text of the day. And then we go into breakout sessions into smaller groups beyond the big coffee hour. And it's been really enlightening and good to meet new people, actually. Yeah, that's right. Here's a question in the chat. Yeah. What do you foresee regarding singing when in-person worship resumes? What are those who are worshiping in person now doing regarding singing? I, you know, I think it depends on the context of, on how many people are in the actual physical space. Um, I've seen a lot of people um, do a good job of plexiglass um, in conjunction with uh, masks. So that some like whoever, I was a virtual preacher for a church um, in New Jersey and the two vocalists were behind plexiglass and six feet, feet apart. The participants had masks on until they weren't speaking um, and the folks that were spread out. So I think it's going to have to be this small incremental um, way of integrating vocalists. I saw another context where the it was a, again smaller ensembles, right? So no more than about six people in the chancel, six feet apart, singing, clearly not facing this way, facing forward. And as soon as they were done, they put their mask um, back on as well. So I, again, I think it's incremental and using the wisdom and the, the resources that we have to say, you know, and, and get people vaccinated, right? So exactly. max folks are getting vaccinated. Are you tracking with that? Are you making sense of that to say, here's, here's how we're handling this. But again, mass, space, plexiglass. I just had this conversation uh, with some of our pastors. I think it's a great way to incrementally bring in singing while we're waiting for the full vaccination of this country. You know, I've had to move my singers from the chancel where the choir loft is down to the floor of the nave and they sing with their masks on Yeah, just because of the distance with the clergy and liturgists up in the chancel. But that seems to be working right now at this point. And we're actually having opening up um, in person on Sunday and so there's a big distance between like where I sit in the pews to where the congregation will be seated, yeah. Yeah, seated in the nave. I do think sometimes you might need a dress rehearsal. At the, you know, before you record, let's just practice. If you're not actively singing, is your mask on? Are you aware of that? How, you know, just so people are starting to be mindful of this is not a everybody, hey, we're all in and everything's like the way it used to be. This is going to be a slow walk to kind of incrementally get prepared for, you know, what this looks like going forward. Sure. How yeah. are you thinking about our rights that are centered in gathering in new ways? How might this enrich, sorry, our churches embrace these values going forward, mm -hmm. such as baptism, communion, ordination, as well as weekly gathering and special worship services like funerals and weddings? 
I'm getting married soon. Uh, <laughs> so I love that. I love that question and, and baptism. I think hybrid, right? Like how, when I think about the, our, these things that we do, you know, in worship, how do you do it so that you can include as many people as possible, right? What does it look like for someone to have streams, um, streaming um, a, a wedding ceremony, streaming a baptism, um, having the camera so that they can get in and, and see the water sprinkled on the baby or, you know, what are these ways that you're engaging um, in that way so that you have a both and peace going forward? I don't think it's it's either or anymore, if that makes sense. That's what I think about, like, um, and the tactile nature of it too. Uh, some of our ordination services, I've seen uh, the ordinand in the, in, you know, standing in the middle and then red streamers um, so that people can hold and keep distance. Well, why would I stop that after COVID? Like, who doesn't love red streamers and tactile things? And maybe you send everybody home, you know, you know, get a red cloth and wave it in the air because someone's been ordained or a blue cloth because someone's been baptized. Like, whatever, what are the tactile things that we do um, and, and multi-sensory things that are possible because of what we're doing? So I think it makes space for your creatives and for your tactile folks to say, you know, we could do this or there's an app for that. Like, this is such a time to be creative. Um, so I think that I get excited about that. I'm like, what can't we do? I think there's a bunch of things we can do. And, and ask those questions when you're planning for worship. Is there something tactile? Is there something hybrid? Is there something more engaging that we can do in this way? If one has an all volunteer choir, how do you decide who gets to come sing and how do you keep from being exclusive? I would assume, Dave, I'm gonna kick this back to you, but I that's would, fine. <laughs> I'm curious how you would answer this. I would assume that there were some, um, if there are section leaders, sometimes it's easier to do section leaders. Um, if you want to, in an egalitarian way, you could just rotate to say, right. you've got four four or six people and you just get on a rotation model and the sound, you know, and, and making sure the selection of music, right, fits the ensemble that is signed up for the day. Correct. Yeah, I think um, in this case, there are no section leaders. So I would say rotation, mm -hmm. um, either a duet or a quartet and then use different voices, try to, knowing your choir, you know, match the voices and rotate. Yeah. That's what I would say. Good answer. How can a presbytery support in, and inspire worship leadership? Um, I think in the presbytery meetings, I'll be honest, I am so um, honored to be a part of a presbytery that's been so creative in COVID, uh, if you go to YouTube and you look up ATL PCUSA, you can see all of our um, worship gatherings. And it's been part of the creativity is lifting up the gifts within the presbytery. So we modeled, here's what virtual worship looks like for a presbytery um, worship meeting. And it's just been life-giving and inspiring and seeing all the different gifts we had a, uh, a virtual welcome from two of our pastors and they gave tour, a tour of their home from parking to where the restrooms were to where to get snacks. It was absolutely hilarious, but it also just lifted up. Here's the creativity. And, I, and part of the creativity is you all are doing this and you're doing a great job. So I think part of the presbytery's role is to lift up and then to get folks over here and over here to say, wow, like we're really, we're really doing this. And look at how our siblings throughout the presbytery are utilizing their gifts in these digital and hybrid uh, times. So there are pros and cons to the chat function in worship. And I wondered what, how you felt about chatting during worship online versus you know, not when we are in worship, we usually don't chat. So I wonder what the pros and cons are to you. You know, it's funny that you say that because 
other siblings and other denominations have been live tweeting worship for years, have been encouraging people to tweet and post and amen, this preacher just said a great thing. So I think personally, I love it. I love the chat feature. I love people engaged in what's happening. Um, I, I think it's, I think it's great. Um, I will actually miss that when I'm in person only. And I can't say, oh my gosh, did you hear that? Amen, preach. Like, uh, it's interactive. It's almost, you know, in the black church, we have call and response. It feels like the call and response is an is, you know, invitation for, for everybody um, in the chat. So I personally love it. Um, it'll be interesting how people, how people will, will interpolate that. Um, go, like there's, my mother watches TV Jake. She's uh, faithfully attends her Presbyterian church, but she also has got to watch the bishop. Um, and there are different programs that if someone tweets or makes a comment, that will come across the screen. And so I, I've been curious, how will people find ways to, again, to do both? But I, I find it to be great, personally. With so many examples of creativity and worship available online for all of us to see, are there ways the Presbyterians can support worship leaders in knowing that their efforts are enough and they can't do it all? Yes, I think um, messaging, um, a note in the newsletter, a reminder that do, do what you can do. I mean, that's, again, um, and I encourage you to go back and, and listen to Bruce Ray's child presentation um, with our Presbytery, because that's what he said. He said, do what you can do. Like, instead of dreaming huge dreams, like what's the little dream that's in front of you? Um, and so I think constantly, every time we're on a call with our pastors, we try to encourage them. Like y'all are really doing it. And we don't, I, we're amazed. So I think, and I, I think there's sometimes if the Presbytery can't do it today, then make sure you call another preacher and let them know they're doing great. Like peer to peer um, encouragement, I think is just as important because um, sometimes Presbyterians get big and there's a lot going on, but I do think um, encouragement and affirmation um, and is, is important. Talk to, talk to us a little bit about communion during COVID. Um, what are some of the creative examples that you've experienced? Yes, I have, um, I think uh, I should have a picture of Palm Sunday for me last year, um, we had, it was, uh, it was communion and I had these funny leaves. I don't, I love plants, but I don't know all the names. And I'm like, I don't have palms, but I have these little funky looking plants. <laughs> and uh, we have uh, camellia trees in the back, which means um, helper to the priest. So I thought that was befitting and some uh, short roses out front. And, and so we had the iPad up and our family just sat around and looked at it. It just, the home piece felt really endearing to me. When I think about scripture, when I think about um, the last supper, when I just, when I think about all those things, um, I thought, wow, Lord, you're really orienting us back home and to be able to do that in our little makeshift Palm Sunday communion space. It was really um, a blessing to me. Uh, there's another picture. There's a great online um, kind of worshiping community uh, by Melva Sampson called the Pink Robe Chronicles. And she um, had asked people to not only set the table, but to set something that reminded them of their ancestors. And so I just thought, what a great, you know, what a great uh, image. So we had a little heart. Um, that we, we put out, that's, that's Melba there. Um, and she's, she does uh, great work. But the, the communion um, table that we set that day had a heart. It also had um, pictures of the three hands of me, my son, and uh, my late first husband, Carl. And so that's on a paperweight, so we put that down. And then there's a holding cross that we used to put in his hand when he was, um, when he was in a nursing home. Um, uh, very sick um, and on hospice from a degenerative neurological condition. 
So, hey, we had all three of those there. And so I just was really, again, I, I would not have been able to do that if I was in one of local congregations unless they had told me um, before. But just to see that and to think about communing with the saints, thinking about how wide the table extends, how we're all connected to one another. So that's one of the cherished moments um, that I have of home communion. You know, when we were pre-recorded, we had invited uh, members of our worship committee to set the table and send in those photographs. Um, I think Andrew has a few to share. Oh. Oh, I love it. Oh. oh, I love it. Oh, that's beautiful. Awesome. Are there music notes in that plate? Yes. <laughs> that's ours. <laughs> oh, that's good. I said them down. That's wonderful. Oh, look at that. You know, there's so many stories, right? For every plate, for every picture, there's a story. Thank you, Andrew. So I've heard you talk about uh, Monday's Thursday service of foot washing and the connection of working on your son's hair. Yeah. Can you share that story? Sure. So, you know, as a presbyter, particularly in virtual space, um, you know, trying to make sure I can get to different people's services. And so one of our churches was having a Monday, Thursday, and a foot washing. My son also has dreadlocks. And, you know, when you got to retool those, it's a very um, endearing time um, in Black households of, of doing hair. And so he runs upstairs, mom, can you retwist my hair? And I'm like, okay, but I, I got to go to church. And so we're sitting there in front of the TV and I'm twisting his hair and the foot washing comes up. And he's like, what is that? I'm like, oh, that's like in the Bible, you wash people's feet and Jesus did it. And he was like, do you want to do it? I'm like, yeah, do you want to do it? He's like, let's do it. So we ran and got a basin and I washed his feet and he washed my feet. And then we went back to, to doing his hair. And it just, again, that's always going to sit with me as a, a sweet memory from the pandemic, of all these difficult things that have been happening. But my kid and I, you know, were able to share an, an intimate spiritual moment. I think it's great. Thanks for sharing that. Mm -hmm. Many churches were already in the process of reorient, reorienting their responses to social justice issues. And the pandemic has heightened our awareness of those inequalities and imbalance of our society around race and poverty. How have we responded as a church? I mean, personally, I think we responded really well. You know, I think um, for people who are able to, to have those conversations, I honor that every context is not in the space um, to handle it. And for those, for a multiple amount of reasons, but for those that were able to have eyes to see, again, our, our word for the year was vision. And we had committed to looking at Matthew 25, um, um, invitation more closely, right, to talk about dismantling structural racism and eradicating poverty and building congregational vitality. We just had no idea that we'd be engaging in it on that level. Um, and so for our presbytery, we've had, you know, more than a few uh, dismantling structural racism town hall events. People have done book studies, they've had conversations uh, um, with other communities of color and other congregations trying to work together. Folks have been marching and listening to the voice of the voiceless. It's To me, it's been very hands-on. And while everybody might not agree on the or different approaches, we couldn't not see it. I think that's the, so when I say I think we're doing a good job is that we have to have to name the things because no one can, no one can hide from it. There's the, the disparity, the difficulty, the need for justice, the racial healing, that has been needed um, and even access, just watching those who have had access around this pandemic in healthcare has been 
absolutely staggering and eye-opening for everybody. So I, I'm really proud of, if I can be proud or I'm thankful that this is a time that I've seen churches that would not have talked about this are talking about it in many different ways and doing things too. Uh, the issue of stewardship related to the pandemic has been raised. Should churches cut back on staff because choirs aren't singing or the building isn't being occupied because it needs to be, doesn't, isn't getting cleaned? What have you seen um, that churches are doing in regard to stewardship? You know, I'm watching people, you know, really live, not live in scarcity, if I could say it in that way, to say we are finding ways to, to keep people employed, even if we have to go to part-time, or there's some folks who are doing better financially because the building isn't being used the way they're used to it being used. Um, I'm seeing people do more missional activity. Um, and so I think, and you know, if there's folks who were able to get uh, the PPP loans that were able to be sustained. So it's really fascinating. You would think that everyone would say, fire everybody and, and hunker down, but I'm not really sure that's how the gospel works. And so instead of saying, all right, Lord, how do we still, how do we still remain the church and to do it in, again, creative, innovative, and efficient ways? And folks really are doing it. Um, I mean, we've not had a lot of, of loss in that regard. The folks have been finding ways to keep their, their team sustained um, in this. And the church has been generous, right? And it's only possible because the folks who are online are finding ways to give. I think making giving accessible in digital ways has been really, really helpful for people as well. Um, so I've seen a abundance mindset and not a scarcity one. And I've seen God do above and beyond what people could ever imagine. So folks are working. <laughs> they are recording, they're connecting, they're, they're doing the thing. Um, and there's, I don't think there's a need to stop being the church. Um, and I think that this season has really proven it. Even within the church, the impact of the pandemic has varied because of economic privilege. Mm. Some churches are struggling financially and some are doing just fine. What is our responsibility to look outward? I think we all, um, I think this whole year has been a shell shock. Like, oh my gosh, this thing has happened to us. Um, and, and also like, uh, what else is happening beyond us? But I think as we're coming up on this one year, is how can we fling our, our arms open? Um, I was invited to write um, some reflections in an article and I talked about Matthew 25 when I was a kid growing up in a black working class neighborhood. And I always had this sense that, you know, there might be somebody who has it worse off than me, right? Like we've got food on the table and the lights are on and I've got designer sneakers and like, you know, I'm doing my thing in the eighties, but I can remember walking past the one in downtown Philadelphia being like, I need, I need to care about that person because I may not have everything, but there's still somebody who is in more need than myself. And so I think of the church always, I don't care who you are, I don't care where you fit on any socioeconomic continuum, that how do I keep my arms open, right? Like Christ offers me this grace, Christ invites me in and has this open arm posture. And if I'm to imitate Christ, then my whole posture, the church's posture, the church's attitude needs to be this way. How can we see those who are in need a little bit more than ourselves? And I think the fact that we're still here, right? Like, even, even if a church has closed, they've probably, those members have had to reimagine who they are in another space. And then they get to participate in that opening and that widening. And we've seen some of that um, as well. How can the church be part of the healing process as people make sense of loss and looking forward? Mm. I think be an example of naming grief, of naming all the tears that have happened in the night and reminding them that joy really does come in the morning. And I think the church needs to get back to testifying 
and being a test, just offering testimonials of, I didn't think I was going to make it, or this thing got underneath my skin, or I wanted to give up, or I wanted to quit, but someone spoke to me. I heard the Lord's voice. I felt the sun shine on my face, and I'm still standing. That's what, that's what we are. We're witnesses, right? You will be my witnesses. I think the church's ability to be an example on grief and resilience work is huge, but we have to be honest about what has been hard, about what we have hated, about like ready to cuss and fuss. We just got to be real and then to say, but we're still here. So, so come, come and be with us or help or let us be where you are. And so I think um, we don't have to pretend like this was easy. It's not, it's still not easy, but we're getting through it with God's help. So I, I think being vulnerable in public space is important. And what do you think the future is in regard to pastoral care in a digital age? Hmm. I'm sorry, I was I cut you off. I was saying we've got a, we've got good music to back up the uh, the grief work to back up the. Oh, sorry, sorry. No, it's okay. I was saying we we've got a good soundtrack. If you want to learn know about weeping and joy, like we can we we have a good playlist as a church to encourage people as well. Um, but with that said, what does pastoral care look like in a in a digital age? Um, you know, I've got a great uh, mindfulness coach that I meet with on Zoom. I've got uh, an EP coach that I meet with on Zoom. I've got a great therapist that I meet with on Zoom. That we we have to engage this piece of it. If teledoc is happening and teletherapy is happening and all those kinds of things, how do we train our people? Because I think that's the other shift too. How do you train people to offer that across the screen? Because I think that's another tactic as well, right? To say, here are the ways that you can do stuff in person, but I don't want to miss out on connecting with people. And I do think, again, it goes back to engagement and intentionality. When people need it a whole lot, I also think kind of more, I don't want to let webinar kind of, how do you get group conversation around this? Because some of the care that people need is from experts. And because this is this is high stuff, that, intense stuff that we're dealing with in terms of communal grief, in terms of multiple losses, in terms of prolonged adaptation to the, our way of life. Some folks really need to make sure they're getting that deep work done. So how do we as a church kind of point people to the professionals as we offer, you know, Stephen's ministry and deacons and that kind of stuff, but make sure that the uh, professional practitioners are out front as well in our churches. Yeah, I've heard of churches that have caregiver groups that have been really helpful as well during this period of time. Absolutely. What do you think the impact on membership and actual attendance at church will look like going forward? I don't know, but I don't think <laughs> the clerks are going to have a heart attack. I don't know. I don't, I just don't know how, I don't know. Like, I've heard people say, I've taken in members across state lines that people who will never physically be at a church are members, giving, connecting, voting, like, this is going to be really interesting how we track. Um, I hope we're prepared for multiple levels of membership. That that it multiple ways that people inter, intersect, I should say. So here's the member that's on the books because they come here physically. Here's the digital membership. One of my uh, elders in our presbytery sent me an article about some virtual church that has like 70,000 people all online. I was like, how, how, what? He's, don't you think we should think about that? I'm like, no, I need stained glass. I don't want to think about that. But I thought it was such a great introduction to say, we are going to have to think differently. And you can count and document anybody, but being again, intentional to say, this isn't the way things used to be. And how do we affirm that and say that out of state member matters just as much as the person who had their favorite spot on the third pew over to the right. Like, they, like those two people are equally important and matter in the life of the church. 
Thank you so much. Are there other questions from our guests? I love that someone talked about their church studying Howard Thurman, because Jesus and the disinherited. I definitely think around justice and pastoral care. There's just some great works out there to, to meet those needs and, and connect with people. Let me remind you of the um, volume 54.4 of Call to Worship. It's worship in the time of COVID. And to, if you have further questions, make sure you look at this as well. I also, I'm not sure if this has been mentioned here, but a lot of us are um, in a public uh, Facebook group called Zoom Faith. If you have not joined that, I encourage you to join that. It is um, administered uh, by Bruce Reyes Chow and other folks are in the admin, but there's so, some of the questions that you're offering here are asked and people check in every Sunday to say, how did it go or how did it not go? <laughs> <laughs> in, your, in your online worship. So I find that's a community of almost 3,000 people. So that's just a great way to connect um, with folks around some of these questions. Will you repeat that again for everybody? Sure, I can. So if you're on Facebook, uh, just in the search, look for Zoom Faith. And that is a public group. Uh, I think it's public. Well, you just have to join it. Um, but anybody can join so that you can ask those questions like, hey, you know, what kind of camera are you using or what's the best um, app to restream, um, you know, or have multiple streaming of your worship services. And so people have those questions and there's all kinds of chat around that. And also every Sunday, they kind of check in to see how people have gone. So Zoom Faith on Facebook. Great, thank you. Aisha, thank you so much for joining us today. Really, really appreciate it. Thank you for having me and um, deep blessings to everyone on the call and anybody who hears this, you are doing the best you can and we're gonna be all right. We're gonna get through it. And um, just know that God sees you and God is honored um, by your faithfulness. Amen. All right, and thank you both uh, for a wonderful discussion and a special thank you uh, to our panelists on behalf of Pam. You all can watch the recording of this town hall or check out our upcoming schedule for future town halls at presbymusic.org slash town dash hall. For the Presbyterian Association of Musicians, I'm Andrew Perkins. Thanks again for joining us and we'll see you next time.